The last part of Lecture 7 deals with periodic trends. We'll start with atomic radius and ionization energy. The discussion on Z-effective was a prequel to understanding the trends of atomic size, orbital energy, electronegativity, and ionization energy. The radius, which is the atomic size, is roughly proportional to n squared over Z-effective. Orbital energies are roughly proportional to negative z effective squared over n squared. Electronegativity is roughly proportional to z effective squared over n squared, this time a positive value, and ionization is roughly proportional to the same formula. So here is a diagram of the trends of the periodic table. And in general, materials on the upper right of the periodic table are small, they have a high electronegativity, and a high ionization energy. So in some ways, you might think about things on the upper right, like fluorine, as tiny, angry chihuahuas. They are small dogs. Some of them can be very ill-tempered. And they like to grab things and hang on to them. Because if you're a small dog, you've got to fight for everything. On the other hand, elements that are on the lower left end of the periodic table tend to be large, have a low electronegativity, and a low ionization energy. So the exact opposite. So what is the opposite of a tiny dog? A very large dog. Very large dogs, in my experience, are relaxed. They're too lazy to chase a ball, so they don't really grab onto things. In fact, they like to drop their toys and their fur all over the house. Now, I have nothing against cats, but I have grown up in a dog household, and I have dogs in my household. Here are my two babies. This was Maximus, who grew up with my three children. He was a big boy. He was 95 pounds, basically all muscle. He's gone across the Rainbow Bridge, so now we have Sweeney. Sweeney came from a rescue at nine months old, and he is just the sweetest dog, as you can see. And he's about 85 pounds. So first, let's look at atomic radius trends within a period. These are proportional to n squared over z effective. So we'll start with lithium. Students are not required to memorize the z-effective numbers, merely the trends. If we go across the second period, n squared is going to remain the same. It will be 2. But what does z-effective do as you go from left to right across a period? It increases. So if the denominator increases, the value of the ratio becomes smaller. Beryllium is smaller, and boron is smaller still, all the way to neon. Neon is the smallest atom in the second period. Now, this is sort of counterintuitive. You might think, well, I'm adding protons and electrons. Shouldn't the atom be getting larger as I go from left to right? Well, don't forget that tractor beam, which tends to draw in the electrons and make the atomic radius smaller. So smaller atoms are on the right side of the periodic table, and larger atoms are on the left side of the periodic table. What about if we go down a group? In that scenario, both n squared and z-effective are changing. So let's start with hydrogen. That would be 1 squared over 1. The next one would be lithium, 2 squared over 1.3. So lithium is larger than hydrogen, and sodium is larger than lithium. So as you go down the group of a periodic table, the atomic radius gets larger. So we're back to the original concept. Small atoms lie on the upper right of the periodic table. Large atoms lie on the lower left of the periodic table. 
What about orbital energy trends in a period? The reason we're covering orbital energy trends is because those will have an impact on electronegativity and ionization energy. These are proportional to minus z effective squared over n squared. So let's start with lithium. Lithium is in period 2, so the 2 squared is on the bottom, and its z effective is 1.3. Now, as we go from left to right across the period, the bottom stays the same, 2 squared. But what does the z-effective value do? It increases, which means that this becomes more negative. And if it becomes more negative, the orbital energy becomes closer to the nucleus. So here are lithium and beryllium's valence electrons on the same energy scale. The nucleus is at the same location at the bottom, and you can see that lithium's one electron is further away from the nucleus than beryllium's two electrons. And if we continue along the second period, you can see that the orbital energies go closer to the nucleus as we go from left to right across the period. So that's basically the same as the radius trend, because honestly, how do you think the atomic radius is measured? Well, from the nucleus to the outermost electron. So if the radius is decreasing, then the orbital energies of the valence electrons must also be decreasing. What happens to valence orbital energy trends if we go down a group? Well, we'll start with carbon, which is in group 4, and period 2. So its relative orbital energy is roughly proportional to minus 3.3 squared over 2 squared, or minus 2.7. Well, what if we go to the next element down, which would be silicon? N will increase, but so will Z effective? Well, it turns out that the n value increases faster. So the valence orbitals of the 3s and 3p are further away from the nucleus than for carbon. They are less negative. And if we go to germanium, the valence orbitals are further still. So just as atomic size increases going down a group, Valence orbital energies become further away from the nucleus as one goes down the group. So in summary for orbital energy trends, the most negative, which means the lowest energy orbitals, are found in the upper right of the periodic table. And the least negative, highest energy valence orbitals that are furthest away from the nucleus are found here in the lower left. So here is a question for you. Which orbital is the lowest in energy? Well, first it would help to look at a periodic table. So let's do that. So we can see that sodium is the one in the upper left. Potassium is directly below it and germanium is to the right. So first I'd like you to think which one of these atoms has the greatest Z effective value. You notice in the question we're comparing all orbitals of the second period. So what I recommend you look for is two things. You want to look for the highest Z effective and the lowest orbital, which means you are comparing 2s and 2p. This tends to be a more challenging question for students. So here is a summary of valence orbital energies and atomic size. If we consider the nucleus at the same location for all of these valence orbitals, we see that lithium, sodium, and potassium have orbitals that are far away from the nucleus and large radii. And as we go from left to right on the periodic table, 
in the upper right corner. Neon, for example, has low energy valence orbitals and a small atomic size. Hydrogen tends to be a little bit unique among the elements, and it's very similar to carbon in its orbital energies. So on the left side of the periodic table, in general, we have atoms that are large, and their electrons are very loose, meaning they might fall off the atom. And on the right side of the periodic table, we have very small atoms that hold tightly to their electrons. One needs to understand orbital energies to understand ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy needed to remove an electron. So if you consider an atom that is neutral and you put energy into the system, you can make a cation by removing one electron from that atom. And we're going to be talking about first ionization energy, which is the energy required to remove the first electron. This question asks which electrons are easier to remove, the pink or the blue? Well, in order to answer this, you need to think about starting far away from the nucleus and reaching down with your hand to grab an electron. Which electrons are you going to encounter first? Well, the pink ones, of course. So the pink ones are further away from the nucleus, so they have less attraction for the nucleus, and are therefore easier to remove. So something with low ionization energy has electrons that are far from the nucleus. An element with high ionization energy has electrons that are close to the nucleus. So let's go back to our orbital energy diagrams of the second period. We would like to know which element in the second period has the lowest first ionization energy. So we're going to start at the top and reach down and grab an electron. And the first electron we encounter belongs to lithium. So lithium would have the lowest ionization energy. Neon would have the highest first ionization energy. So here is a summary of valence orbital energies and ionization energy. You notice it looks exactly like the radius diagram. Except this time, we're going to picture lifting the electron to the ceiling. Which is easier? An electron that belongs to potassium? Well, that's pretty easy to lift to the ceiling. We don't have to lift it very far. Whereas neon would hold very tightly to its electrons, and it would take considerable energy to pull that electron away from the nucleus to the ceiling. So an electron that can be removed easily has low ionization energy. An electron that is difficult to remove has high ionization energy.